Do you guys remember Jesse Smouye? Or is it Jesse Smollett? Jesse Smollett? Maybe we'll just call him Juicy for this video. Shout out Dick Masterson, I'm stealing that from you. We're now calling him Juicy. He's a 41 year old actor who was doing really well for himself just a few years ago. He starred in the show on Fox called Empire, like on TV, which is basically a show about like a hip hop dude and his entertainment empire. And Jesse played a character called Jamal Lyon. He was on the main cast of the show. He was like a major character. Well, a few years ago, Juicy had his career absolutely ruined when it turned out that he was lying in more than just the TV show. See what I did there? Because his name in the show is Lion. And there is no doubt in your mind what motivated this attack. I could only go off of their words. I mean, who says empire, this MAGA country, ties a noose around your neck and pours bleach on you? And this is just a friendly fight? I will never be the man that this did not happen to. Mm. I am forever changed. And I don't subscribe to the idea that everything happens for a reason, but I do subscribe to the idea that we have the right and the responsibility to make something meaningful out of the things that happen to us, good and bad. What do you feel people need to hear the most from this story? I think that what people need to hear is just the truth. It's just the truth, because Everybody has their own idea. Some are healing and some are hurtful. But I just want young people, young members of the LGBTQ community, young black children to know how strong that they are, to know the power that they hold in their little pinky. This guy had the balls to lie on national TV about an attack, and he did it for months and months straight. You could make an entire cringe compilation of this dude lying, and it would be super entertaining. And to this day, he actually maintains his innocence that it wasn't a hoax. Somehow, I don't know what his reasoning is, considering the abundance of evidence the police have against him that he clearly faked this whole thing. If I did this, then it means that I stuck my fist in the fears of black Americans in this country for over 400 years, and the fears of the LGBTQ community. Your Honor, I respect you, and I respect the jury, but I did not do this, and I am not suicidal, and if anything happens to me when I go in there, I did not do it to myself, and you must all know that. He faked a hate crime, and once the police investigated, they discovered a detailed plot to basically fake it and get attention from it. The reason I'm talking about him today is because he just lost his appeal in the Illinois courts. He was basically sentenced to 150 days in jail for that crime, which in my view is probably not enough, but that's what he got, that's what we're dealing with. And he's since filed an appeal basically trying to get out of jail because, once again, he believes he's falsely accused, and he's trying to claim that the hiring of a special prosecutor on the case, which we'll get into later, is part of the reason why it was mishandled. That appeal was denied. Good. His lawyers, Nenye E. Uchi, Uch, Uch, I don't know how to say these names, and Heather A. Wydell, okay, a normal name, W. Riz, this is gonna sound a little bit, oh, you know, but like, why can't people just be named like Tyler, Chris, Aaron, Tom, these are easy names, okay? Nenye E. Uchi. I'm a YouTuber. How am I supposed to be educated enough to say this name? Argue that the renewed prosecution, a second indictment of Smollett and additional punishment violated the actor's due process rights, in part because a binding non-prosecution agreement was not enforced and that Smollett was subjected to double jeopardy. They also took issue with the controversial appointment of a special prosecutor in the case. If Mr. Smollett's convictions are allowed to stand, this case will set a dangerous precedent by giving prosecutors a second bite at the apple anytime there's dissatisfaction with another prosecutor exercise of discretion. His attorneys wrote in the brief and argument, which was posted online on the appellate court's website. Now, obviously, in the position he's in, Juicy is going to do anything he can to get out of jail, and I mean literally anything, and his lawyers are working overtime to find some way to overturn the conviction or just get him out, which is, you know, what lawyers do. They're being good lawyers to their credit. Doesn't seem to be working, though. They're really grasping at straws here, but the state of Illinois upheld the conviction, which means he's not getting out. Sorry, Juicy. Better luck next time, bro. Try out a YouTube channel, okay? Nobody's going to stop you there. You don't even got to get hired. There's no process. Come on the podcast. I know you're watching. I know you're a turkey tomer. But let's rewind the clock to when this case started because it's actually a very interesting story with way more twists and turns than you probably would expect given the fact that he was convicted. This goes all the way back to January of 2019. Juicy tells the Chicago Police Department that he was attacked earlier that morning by some racists. He claimed that he was just going for a walk in Chicago in the middle of the night, minding his own business, when suddenly two white guys approached him. They tell him, this is MAGA country, because they're chuddies who would obviously do such a thing. They call him racial slurs and homophobic slurs as well and then he says that they poured bleach on him and tied a noose around his neck while they beat him up he calls the cops they come to his house and there he still has the noose around his neck and he tells them he wanted them to see it basically to prove that it happened which is why he didn't take it off before they got there do you want to take it off or anything yeah i do i just want to 
So obviously this immediately made national headlines. A successful young black actor who's the victim of a vicious hate crime. Nevertheless, a young black gay actor. And it's a result of the current president's supporters, right? MAGA country. And that president, Trump, is like the most controversial person in modern politics, if not like recent culture ever. So obviously it's going to make a bunch of headlines. But the cops were very suspicious from the start. First of all, the attack is just way too perfect. This is MAGA country. A noose? Bleach? I mean, you couldn't make up a more like racist story if you wanted to. It's certainly possible that this could happen, but the likelihood is so low. The actual execution, like how it was carried out, is so cartoonishly evil. It just seems so unlikely. Like, were these people just walking around ready with a bleach and noose and, like, MAGA hats on looking for, for Juicy? Did they know where he was? Were they stalking him? And on top of that, the fact that it happened to a relatively famous celebrity who's on a popular show, I mean, something was off here. And if this did happen, the chances of it happening are so, so low, they needed a lot more evidence. And what they also needed was a conviction. Because these two men, if they did this, should be arrested and put in jail and whatever else the court can throw at them for their heinous crime. One thing Jesse claimed about this case is that he was on the phone when it went down. But when the police asked for his phone, he refused to turn it over. And his music manager did tell detectives they were on the phone as the alleged attack unfolded. But investigators were unable to independently verify phone records because Smollett declined to turn his phone over. And it's in my opinion that even other city officials who are aware of this happening were pretty iffy on if it actually went down. I think they thought something was fishy from day one. Obviously, uh, the alleged statement of what happened here is horrific, and there's no place for it here in the city of Chicago. Mayor Rahm Emanuel talks about a case attracting national headlines. Actor Jussie Smollett telling police he was brutally attacked in Chicago early Tuesday morning. Police tell ABC7 a dozen detectives are pursuing new leads, including grainy photos of two persons of interest. But there's these two guys who allegedly attacked him. There's some CCTV footage of them walking around. The police are going to figure out who they are, obviously. This is not going to be a mystery for too long. About two weeks after the attack, the police raid the home of Abimbola and and Ola Binjo Osundairo, I just butchered those names for sure, no, no doubt about it, who were Nigerian immigrants living in Chicago. They had also acted as extras on the show Jesse was on, so there was a clear link between them where they had some kind of working relationship. But you'll notice these brothers are black, not white, as Jesse initially said. Despite this, the cops found bleach in their house and took them into police custody on suspicion of battery. At the time, though, they weren't actually charged. They were just in there on suspicion they were being held for questioning. Two days later, they get released into the wild once again, and the cops claim they let them go because they got some new evidence when talking to them. We didn't know what this was at the time, but the cops say they're now investigating if the attack even happened at all, implying it may have been staged. Chicago police told ABC News, police are investigating whether the two individuals committed this attack or whether the attack happened at all. Smollett released a statement Thursday evening saying, today Jesse did answer routine follow-up questions for Chicago Police Department and continues to cooperate. So when this comes out, the rumor mill really, really starts going like crazy. Some people speculate that Jesse was being written off of Empire for what he did or because he was being written off Empire, he wanted to do this for attention, right? He staged the attack so he could get more notoriety on himself and maybe get some more roles. Others say that he didn't lie and there's no way he could lie about something like this in a million years. And to their credit, it does seem insane that someone would lie about something that's so easy to disprove, especially someone of this high of a public profile, like a mainstream TV celebrity. Meanwhile, Jesse is busy doing a full-on media campaign to get this story out there. The most famous interview he did is on ABC News, where Robin Roberts interviews him for the first time after the attack. Here, he maintains the entire time that it did happen Happen, and that he is a gay black man was attacked brutally by these like racist Trump supporters. And here his story is a little more fleshed out for the first time for the public and we can actually kind of pick it apart and see maybe what's going on in this head here. His timeline is that he lands off of a plane in Chicago, gets to his apartment, and then realizes he doesn't have any food. He tries to go to Walgreens to get some cigarettes, but if you said you're just hungry, why, why are you going to get some Newports, dog? What's going on? Kind of a weird inconsistency there, but whatever, moving on. But then he realizes that Walgreens is closed when he previously thought they were open 24-7. So he goes to a sub way to get a salad. And that's like, obviously the first lie. That's so obvious. Like, you went to Subway to get a salad? Get a sandwich. Get a footlong. What is wrong with you? That is true psychopath shit above anything else I've read in this case. This is a sick and twisted individual right here, boys and girls. Ordering a salad at Subway? Be for real, bro. So I called him up and I said, hey, I'm going to run to Subway, which was across the street, and I'm going to get a salad. Do you want anything? I'm going to get a salad. This is worse than a hate crime. Do you eat salads, Jesse? What are you, a rabbit? From there, Jesse says he gets his order, goes outside, and then he hears someone say, Empire, like scream, hey, Empire! 
vampire which is the name of the show he's on and this is the second most obvious lie in the entire story because the lie is to make him look better to make him look more popular look i know empire was a popular show or whatever i know it was really popping off at the time i think it had decent like critical reviews as well and i'm sure juicy made buckets of money off of it but the idea that these two white maga dudes would know what empire is or know like the main cast or, or like know their names or be able to recognize them randomly on the street in chicago is insane i mean jesse's not a bad looking dude you know he's, he's he's a handsome dude for tv obviously but he's not like a super memorable looking guy like you, you probably see a hundred guys that look like jesse in any city you go to so the idea that they would instantly recognize him as like the empire guy and know like it's just ridiculous and he's not even the main character either if you go to promotional material he's not on the cover the main actor and then like that girl is on the cover right it's not him you're not himothy jesse but he wanted to seem like he was himothy he wanted to seem like he was the main character of the story and that they would instantly recognize him and like oh famous guy let's get his ass and while he was on the phone i uh heard as i was crossing the intersection i heard empire and i don't answer to empire <laughs> my name ain't empire uh and I didn't answer. My name ain't Empire, I don't answer to that name. And then they call him the N-word, according to Jesse. I kept walking and then I heard Empire they're wearing masks. They tell him it's MAGA country. And then he claims that they punch him. He punches them back. Once again, he's like inflating the story to make it seem like he's more tough and badass than he actually is because you take one look at that guy and you know if you punch him, he'll probably start crying on the spot and talking to you about his childhood trauma. Like me. My name ain't Empire. They're fighting. The second guy kicks him and then they run off into the distance. He also says he was still on the phone during this time with his manager and his phone had fallen out of his pocket. So there should be like a recording of this somewhere. Maybe phone records would at least show that this call happened and like when it started and ended so we could have some kind of circumstantial thing related to it but we have yet to see that publicly at all and as i said earlier jesse didn't want to give his phone to the cops so the story goes that after the attack he walks all the way home keep in mind with the rope still around his neck okay and then when he gets there he calls the police they come over and the investigation starts one of the things that juicy says bothers him the most in this interview is the idea that people are not even willing to hear his side he says they're not willing to accept the truth at all he almost seems more hurt at not being believed than the pain he feels from the attack itself i'm pissed off what is it that has you so angry? Is it the, the attackers? It's the is attackers, it... but it's also the attacks. It's like, you know, at first it was a thing of like, listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Then it became a thing of like, oh, how can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you not believe that? It's the truth. And then it became a thing of like, oh, it's not necessarily that you don't believe that this is the truth. You don't even want to see the truth. This is a very strange, strange interview. I'm not a body language expert, so I, I can't tell you if he's like really lying here or anything. I mean, I know he's lying with hindsight, but I can't tell you if it's like so obvious here that he is lying. But I can say that the heavy moral posturing and the righteous indignation makes me pretty suspicious. Obviously, with hindsight, we know it was faked, but watching this at the time, I remember being a little bit weirded out uh, and not really being able to describe why. And a lot of other people had the same feeling as me too. And now, obviously, the entire comment section is like, this interview aged like milk. Three days after the police raid these brothers home like the nigerian immigrants who you know were maybe involved in some way that takes us to february 16th 2019 at this point two sources tell cnn independently that investigators have made a major break in the case the police apparently found evidence that jesse paid these guys three thousand five hundred dollars to stage the attack i feel like that's not a ton of money for something of this caliber like faking something that's going to be on national news i feel like you should have done like 10 grand i don't know you know what he's he's cutting corners here i wonder if he put that as a business expense and reported it to the irs that year from the money he made from the publicity although i don't know that he made that much money from this considering you know everything the cops also got financial records of the brothers which proved that they bought ski masks gloves the rope as well as the red hat they apparently couldn't even find a real maga hat and just had to like buy a red one because the store they went to didn't sell it a security guard at the store vividly remembers the pair they wanted a hat okay make america great but we don't sell hats like whoa that. whoa whoa they asked you for a mega hat yes so this one, it's kind of obvious what happened here. For some reason, Jesse wanted attention, he wanted to be seen as a victim, and he wanted it to be on a national stage. So he pays these dudes $3,500 to rough him up a bit, but not that much so he can still be on TV. And then he gets media coverage. But he was dumb enough to not find independent, like, people from this, right? To, you know, to not find random people. He was dumb enough to pay people he had previously worked with on the TV show he's on. So he and them pretty quickly got caught. With all of that together and coming out, the media coverage around this story changed drastically from victim of hate crime to potential victim 
victim of hate crime to now famous actor lied about a hate crime to get attention to make trump supporters look bad to make himself look like a victim to have something to cry about to take a part in this like lgbtq victim complex and a grand jury decides to charge him with a class 4 felony for filing a false police report which carries a maximum sentence of three years in prison smooye smollett uh decides to lawyer up as he should and he hires Mark Garagos, or Garag, I don't know how to say his name, whatever, Mark. Now, Mark is a pretty interesting dude. Interesting? What am I f***ing from Azerbaijan? He, interesting. Mark is a pretty interesting dude. He's a criminal defense attorney based out of Los Angeles, and he has a track record of dealing with celebrities. For example, in 2002, the year I was born, he represented Winona Ryder when she was caught stealing $5,500 worth of merchandise from a store. Thanks to him, she only got three years of probation and some psychological counseling. Thankfully for Winona, I'm actually a psychological counselor and if she wants to shoot me a DM on Instagram uh, I'm, I'm ready to help her with whatever she needs whenever she needs it um, and I I will do anything Winona anything anything Mark also represented Michael Jackson in the early stages of him being accused of touching up on some young boys. He represented Bill Clinton's brother, Roger, and he even represented Chris Brown when Chris went Kimbo Slice mode on Rihanna. So this dude has taken on a lot of interesting challenges in terms of defending the indefensible, really. Apart from Winona, who I would defend any day, no matter how much she stole, please. And Jesse would be his latest challenge. This dude is like Tyler Perry in Gone Girl. He just loves the thrill of it. He loves the thrill of being involved in these cases um, of, of like high, you know, high caliber, high attention right? He likes to take them on. And as more details came out, it became more apparent just how fakes this whole thing was. According to an ABC News interview with Eddie T. Johnson, who was the superintendent of the Chicago PD at the time, the brothers had on gloves during the staged attack where they punched him a little bit, but as far as we can tell, the scratches and bruising that you saw on his face was most likely self-inflicted. So apparently Jesse, after the attack, even roughed himself up just to have like a little bit more of an injury so that it seemed more believable. The men, who are brothers, were arrested on February 13th, but then released without charges, with police saying they were no longer considered suspects. And when they're not considered suspects, that means they ratted, that means they talked. That's that's what that means right now. So the goons are released, and Jesse is officially on the chopping block. On March 8th, he was charged with 16 counts of false report of offense related to what happened. And then news comes out that Tina Chen, who is a Chicago attorney, had contacted the state's attorney about the Smollett case and asked that the case be handed over to the FBI in full. Apparently, the superintendent of the police agreed with this. Meanwhile, when charged formally, Jesse pleads not guilty. And they didn't keep Jesse in Chicago, which is also kind of unusual. They actually allowed him to free travel to meet with attorneys in New York and California. He was just chilling out, really, and he also had all the time in the world to do that interview with Robin and get this story bigger and bigger and keep claiming that he was innocent. I guess they also probably did not consider him a flight risk because, I mean, where's he gonna go? He wanted attention in the first place. He's getting it. From March to August of that year, there were a bunch of issues with the trial, though. Initially, the charges against Jesse were actually dropped from the first investigation. They were they were dropped altogether, and the court file was sealed, which is very confusing, very confusing and unusual in these cases. Why the f with someone who lied about a crime and is this high profile have their case thrown out. How could this happen? They basically were ready to let him off with just forfeiting his $10,000 bail and doing 16 hours of community service, which is nothing to this guy. I mean, he's undoubtedly a millionaire, right? $10,000 to Jesse Smollett is nothing. There seemed to be some behind the scenes politics going on though that was causing this case to be deprioritized by the state's attorney. And then the state's attorney office starts getting heavy criticism for this and it becomes a story in its own right where people are accusing them of basically dropping this because of some supposed political connections that Jesse has. This article reads, National and State Prosecutors Associations have blasted the Cook County State's Attorney's Office for its handling of the Jesse Smollett case. Sorry, Juicy Small It's case. With an Illinois group saying Kim Fox has failed in her most fundamental ethical obligations to the public. Kim Fox, by the way, is the Cook County State's Attorney, which is where Chicago is in Illinois. In case you didn't know, she's been in that position since 2016 and she's still the State's Attorney, I believe, right now. The Illinois Prosecutors Bar Association said the dismissal of the charges without any admission of guilt by Smollett was an affront to prosecutors across the state, as well as police, victims of hate crimes, and the county as a whole. Smollett's hot button case ended in abrupt fashion Tuesday when prosecutors suddenly dropped all 16 felony counts of disorderly conduct. The reversal came only a month after prosecutors charged him with staging an attack on himself and then falsely claiming he was the victim of a hate crime. While not mentioning Fox by name, the association's statement on best practices said a prosecutor should not take advice from politically connected friends of the accused, should not recuse herself without recusing the entire office, and noted that a case with the consequences sequential effects of Mr. Smollett's should not be resolved without a finding of guilt or innocence. So there seems to be a big accusation here from the Bar Association that this case was dropped because Jesse has friends in high places who basically nudged Fox to drop it altogether and give Jesse an easy way out. I don't know that that happened. You don't know that that happened, but that's kind of what they're getting at a little bit here. Fox communicated with politically connected
Hampton lawyer Tina Chen, as well as a relative of Smollett's about the case in the early stages of the investigation. She also said she recused herself from the case, setting those communications, but did not withdraw the whole office and seek a special prosecutor. And Smollett was not required to admit any wrongdoing, leaving prosecutors to insist they had a strong case and the defense to proclaim his innocence. This case in Chicago illustrates a point that must be discussed in an effort to ensure fairness in our criminal justice system. The rich are treated differently, the politically connected receive favorable treatments, and Lady Justice sometimes peeks under her blindfold to see who stands before her, said the statement from the National Group. The Illinois Prosecutors Bar Association cited similar concerns and noted the appearance of impropriety was magnified when Smollett's charges were suddenly dismissed as a last-minute hearing with no advanced public notice. Hints from top Cook County prosecutors that Smollett's arrangement was part of a formal deferred prosecution program were plainly misleading and inaccurate, the group said. Central to any diversion program, however, is that the defendant must accept responsibility, the group said, through the repeated misleading and deceptive statements to the public on Illinois law and circumstances surrounding the Smollett dismissal, the state's attorney has failed in her most fundamental ethical obligations to the public, the state group said. So it seemed like for the time being, Jesse was going to get off. Juicy would not be juiced. He would not be adequately squeezed. He would be fine. $10,000, 16 hours of community service, and legally he wouldn't even have to admit that he staged this thing. That's insane. The unanswered questions surrounding the development of this led many people wondering what might have happened behind the scenes. It also appeared to have caught Chicago police brass by surprise and brought swift condemnation from Mayor Ram Emanuel, who called it a whitewash of justice. So the city of Chicago is fighting over this case. The Bar Association is fighting with the state's attorney. Jesse's friends in high places are apparently allegedly trying to do him favors. And the public is watching all of this go down in real time as Jesse makes a fool out of himself. But at this point, it looked like he was going to get off. It looked like he was going to be just fine. He was going to be A-OK. He was going to get away with it. Meanwhile, the new mayor, who had just been coming into office at this time, Lori Lightfoot, who I'm sure many of you recognize for her beautiful appearance. <laughs> stated that the Jesse thing was just not that important and the city just didn't want to spend money and time on it at the time. Which, I mean, makes, it kind of makes sense a little bit. Like, I kind of get it. Like, there are definitely bigger priorities in Chicago with, you know, the crime going on there, right? They, they, they have other things to worry about. But at the same time, like, this guy lied. Like, he needs to be brought to justice. You can't just let him off now that he's seen the entire public eye on him. You can't just let him off now, you know? It's gonna give the impression that other people can fake crimes and be fine. I mean, I'll fake a crime for $10,000. That's not so bad. 16 hours of community service? That's like two days, okay? Wash a couple dishes, spend a little time at the food kitchen, and you get to be on national TV for being a victim of a hate crime. Me and the members of the BWC gang have actually been conjuring up some way to, you know, basically think about something like this similar, you know, considering, you know, us white boys are kind of being being downtrodden lately in society. We've been thinking about getting some people involved. I'll keep you guys posted on that. Obviously, this is not an admission of guilt, but, you know, me and the BWC boys are concocting a plan to get on national TV, and we'll let you know how that goes. I'm not going to comment on any pending litigation. Obviously, this was a decision that was made by the current mayor, Ram Emanuel. Like was said in a statement via ABC Chicago. We've got a lot of things on our plate, a lot of pressing issues that are truly affecting people's lives. This doesn't rank as a matter of any importance to me. It looked like there would not be any true justice for Jesse. But then something changed. A hero enters our story who would go on to change the game and actually get something done, which you don't always get. Enter United States Attorney Dan K. Webb. He's been involved in a lot. From co-founding the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force to crack down on organized crime and drugs, to serving as special counsel during the Iran-Contra affair. There, he successfully prosecuted John Poindexter. Wait, that's a real name? Poindexter? I thought that was like a joke name in movies. I mean, this is literally the 20th century equivalent of being called like Joe Soyjack and that being your legal name. Just change your last name. That whole family is like, listen, just change it. And he got him for lying to Congress. He, he owned this guy. This Poindexter dude got destroyed. While he works in the private sector now, he's sometimes called upon as a special prosecutor, like he was with the Jesse case. He was assigned to review the case and determine why the charges were dropped, particularly why Kim Fox had decided to drop all of it all of a sudden. And shortly after they managed to get search warrants ordering people to turn over all of Jesse's emails, photos, location data, and direct messages leading up to the attack. And finally, we get some new charges in February of 2020, one full year after the attack, actually about a year and a month after the attack happened, right? Six felony counts of disorderly conduct for the false reports is what he gets nailed with. Now, Jesse's lawyer immediately tries to get it dismissed, and the judge is like, how about no? Get on, Jesse. Now, the prosecution makes some major headway. They find a video of Jesse in a car with the two attackers a few days before the attack happened. Jesse, then in a in a big twist, in court claims that he had a homosexual relationship with one of the attackers. I don't see how that helps his case if he was banging the guy who attacked him, but I don't know. I guess I guess that's what he's saying happened now. But this guy, uh, one of the brothers, insists that he's not gay and tries to prove it in court. He basically is like, Listen, guys, I may do gay things for money, but in all reality, I like women. I may have done those like 100 gay things, but I don't actually like guys. Like, I just wasn't attracted to it. I was just trying to get a bag. Respect the grind set, brother. Respect the hustle. I know times are tough out here. You did what you had to do. <laughs> I am not gay. 
I have relationships with women and sex with men. And I got news for you. That means you're gay. This guy whose name is Ola Bingo. Are we sure about that? Then goes on to further testify about how he orchestrated the attack. He says that Jesse had received some hate mail at his TV studio in Chicago. This gives him the idea to have two MAGA guys attack him and get a bunch of media attention. The police getting involved was not part of the plan. Guys, so like this crime like happened to me, like I'm a victim of a crime, but like I don't want the police involved. Like, you know what? Like the police are just like kind of a hat. Like, they're just kind of annoying. Like I just don't need that. Like I just, I just don't F with them, okay? I don't like their vibe. I'm not into their vibe. I'm not into how they work. I'm not into their, their methods of madness. I just don't need that kind of energy in my life anymore, okay? I'm past that. I'm a different person. But it did happen, and you can trust my sources. Osendairo also addressed the defense's contention that they were driven by homophobia. He testified that he has nothing against gay people. The jury was shown a photo of the siblings taking part in Chicago's 2015 Gay Pride Parade dressed as Trojan warriors. Guys, I, I don't hate gay people. And the way you know is that I dress up like a Trojan warrior and go to pride parades. I mean, to his credit, that's a good way to know, but that just, that must have been, that must have been hilarious to see in court. After more trial shenanigans, Jesse is finally sentenced on March 10th, 2022. For his six counts of disorderly conduct, he has to spend 150 days in county jail and pay $120,000 for the overtime spent on this case by the police officers involved. During his sentencing, the judge, who was very adamant about Jesse being guilty in all counts, called him narcissistic, selfish and arrogant. He pointed out how it was clearly premeditated and that it's obvious this guy was full of shit. Based on the abundance of evidence, the testimony of the brothers, and his lack of proper response as to what happened. One choice quote from the judge is when he says, you're just a charlatan pretending to be the victim of a hate crime. And the mayor, who initially said the case was not a priority as of her election around the time the case began, also had a very clear statement condemning Juicy. The criminal conviction of Jesse Smollier by a jury of his peers and today's sentencing should send a clear message to everyone in the city of Chicago that false claims and allegations will not be tolerated. The city feels vindicated in today's ruling that he's being held accountable and that we will appropriately receive restitution for his actions. And more recently, as I said, Jesse's lawyers attempted to appeal that decision and that was shot down pretty quick. At the end of all of this, the biggest question you probably have on your mind is why? Why did Jesse do this? For what reason did he even think he could get away with it even if he wanted to? Well, it's hard to say really. The dude does seem genuinely delusional about what he could get away with. Even if it's obvious it was not going to work out for him in the end, he thought he could get away with this and the police just like wouldn't care, I guess. Maybe he's just like pampered from being in Hollywood and getting away with whatever he wants to do for so long that it's like shocking to him that he would face consequences for his actions, but I don't really know. I don't really know. When Dr. Phil went on the Joe Rogan podcast, he posited that false accusers will often lie about something due to some other injustice they feel they're they're being dealt somewhere else in their life. So the idea is that the false accusation is basically a projection of some other issue they have where they feel they were mistreated and were a genuine victim. And so their rationale in their mind is like, well, I was mistreated by this other person. This is just a manifestation of that that I'm trying to show the world, which is not like a good justification, but you know, that's plausible, I guess. They really feel like it's emblematic of how the system treats them overall. This is just a dramatic example of it. Mm. I mean, they, they feel like I'm treated this way anyhow. Ah, so they're just... I'm discriminated against, I suffer bias, I'm put down. This is just a focused example of that. So I'm really not lying. I'm just role-playing how I'm overall treated. Oh, wow. So they justify it in their mind. If they're just going to bring all this treatment into one example to bring it into focus. And so while it's a phony deal, it really is truthful representation of what their life is really like. They justify it in that way. Oh, how weird. Once again, this is just a, a theory, a game theory, if you will. That's just a game theory. Hate crime theory. I have no evidence for that, but maybe Jesse felt wrong in some other parts of his life and just transferred those negative feelings to this case. He wanted people to feel bad for him. He wanted to be seen as a victim. That much is clear. From doing some cursory reading about the psychology of these people, Jesse seems to fall into the attention-seeking category of false accusers. It's not like he was confused as to what happened. I mean, this was a very clear premeditated attack that he planned out to look like a victim, right? I mean, that's not hard to guess with this case, but I guess I was hoping for some secret, like, hidden lore from the brain people about why these things happen and why they go down. I didn't get it, honestly. I think the dude just wanted attention. That's all there is to it. He just wanted to, you know, he wanted to be seen on TV. He wanted to be seen crying. He wanted to have some kind of victim story. Maybe because his life is too good. He didn't think anyone would feel bad for him for anything. Meanwhile, these brothers have made an entire career off of talking about this. Their account on Instagram 
Instagram has 250,000 followers, and apparently they're producing some kind of documentary with Lionsgate about this. It's surprising to me that these guys got off, but perhaps because the attack was fake, they didn't file the police report, and Jesse was the real mastermind. The prosecutors figured why even bother. They also cooperated with the cops in the first place. They, you know, they fessed up pretty quick. Within the two days they were in custody, the cops got the entire story out of them. So it turns out being a rat can actually get you pretty far in life. Try it out sometime. Shout out 6 9 6 9 this and 6 9 that Empire, meanwhile, ended in 2020, so obviously Jesse will not be on that show anymore. Hard to say if he'll be fine long-term or if finances are going to be a struggle for him. He's not exactly hireable material anymore, but I also don't think anybody feels bad for him for that. I certainly don't. Kind of a bad look to have someone who was convicted of making up a hate crime for attention on your show. Um, and producers, Hollywood, everyone knows this. Why would they want to work with him? He's a fucking liability through and through. Plus, who's to say he won't lie about whoever he works with next in the future for even more attention? You would think this guy learned his lesson, but... I I would not be too sure, you know, obviously. Jesse, I don't trust you, okay? But uh, yeah, it seems like Jesse's story's pretty much over. We probably are not gonna hear a ton from him in the future. I'd be curious to see if he's gonna do some kind of interview, like, more recently on this. Maybe when he gets out of jail again. But as far as I've seen, we're probably not gonna get anything, because that could probably ruin his case, uh, if he trips up his story again. So obviously, we're probably not gonna hear that. But I think he did go to the BET Awards in 2022, so. Shout out Black Excellence, Jesse. You're making him proud, bro. Anyway, if you guys like this video, be sure to leave a like if you disliked it leave a dislike and leave a comment down below with your thoughts it's always good to hear what you guys have to say do you believe jesse do you know the truth which is that he actually is a victim of a hate crime and he, he was telling the truth the whole time only i know that yeah like i said leave a comment down below thank you guys for the support on the videos recently i do appreciate it and uh yeah i'll see you all in tomorrow's video bye i actually hate all of you so just don't don't come back wait please do and be sure to become a member for five dollars a month they get the members only podcast and exclusive videos that only members get Thanks so much for your support. No